Hello everyone, this is Alan Gocho, your host of True Crime Man's Dark Imagination. And if this is your first time here, hit that subscribe button, the like button, and hit the bell so you'll be notified of any future episodes. Here on True Crime Man's Dark Imagination, we have produced episodes that depicted some of the most horrendous crimes known to mankind. We decided that we would divert just a tad and bring you the story of a true crime fighter. Joseph Petrozino was a man of high principles and a die-hard work ethic. Moreover, he sought to rid the United States of a clandestine criminal organization and thus dispelling the myth that all Italians belonged to an international underworld enterprise. This struggle came at a great personal cost. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the American landscape was dotted with the many ethnicities that came to the New World looking for brighter opportunities. One of the most prevalent groups were those who emigrated from the Mediterranean, specifically the Italians and the Sicilians. Rampant taxation and failures of important crops forced them to make their way to the land where streets appeared paved with gold. But along with the hard-working citizens, a criminal element stowed away on the ships to seek their opportunities as well, often preying on their own people. Members of a criminal class known as the Mafia, or the Camorra, terrorized those that worked hard and saw a sizable amount of their income going to protection for their families, and if they were lucky enough, their businesses. This fear drove many to shy away from notifying authorities for fear of their lives. This fear was real and started a long time before those immigrants arrived in America. The two original uh, organized crime families uh, on the island of Sicily were the Stupogieri and the Giardieri, and they grew out these protection leagues. Because Sicily was plagued by invasions from all countries uh, in the Mediterranean rim. So they, uh, they, uh, they had set up these protection leagues, and the two famous ones was the Stupagieri and the Giardieri. One originated in Montreal over the mountains of uh, over Palermo, and the other one, I think, was in near, near between Suffolk and, and, and Messina. Did they ever fight against each other? Oh, yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and then they, when they immigrated here to the United States in the 19th century, they brought all that garbage with them, that hatred and all that. They were competing with one another for different things in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and most notoriously, New Orleans. But one member of the New York Police Department sought to end the grip that the Mafia held over the denizens within his city and made the commitment to eradicate the Mafia from his city and the lives of Italians and Sicilians. Giuseppe Joe Petrozino dedicated his life to the principle of bringing the noted criminal organization to its knees and eliminating its influence within his area of the United States. Italian. When you talk about this trust, Italians, Sic Sicilians, distrusted authority figures, okay? Did he kind of break that down a little bit to where they, he, he showed them that they could trust him? Or do you think he was just, because he spoke the languages, he, he I think they trust I think, you know, you got to go back. It's, it's not unlike what's going on today in a black community. Most of the victims of black crime are black people. Most of the victims of Italian crimes are Italian people. So if you're sitting in a tenement in the lower east side of Manhattan, and you're getting extorted, maybe you have a little fruit stand, and you're making enough money to, to, to feed your family and, and maybe buy a few nice things, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they see that you're doing okay, you're going to be a target for their extortion. 
And if you don't pay the protection, they're going to kill you or, or blow up your store. And that's what happened here in New Orleans, most notably with the GM Connors in 1907 or 1908. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 those people were tired of it. They didn't want to, they worked every day and night. You look at these old pictures of these immigrants, these immigrants coming off the ship, going to Ellis Island, leaving Ellis Island, coming to Manhattan. The only thing they wanted was an even break. Mm -hmm. In the country they told, they were told, they would give them an even break. And when you got here, their worst enemy were their own people. So I think that's where Petrosino jumped in the breach and said, look, I'm going to protect the good Italians and I'm going to go after the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, that's, that's where he went from detective to sergeant to lieutenant. Mm -hmm. yeah, quick. Joe Petrosino arrived in New York with his family in 1873. Joe's father was a tailor, and like all the artisans in Little Italy, he was approached for protection money, and to survive, he gave in and paid the sum. Joe hated this. Joe had other ambitions. He wanted to learn English, become a U.S. citizen, but most of all, he wanted to become a law enforcement officer. In those days, the police department was controlled by Irish immigrants, and even to imagine an Italian in uniform was a distant dream. Running the entire department was a controller who would later become President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Joe was stubborn. He set up his shop as a shoeshine man right outside police headquarters, befriended police officers, and then submitted his application to become a policeman. It was promptly dismissed, but Joe keeps resubmitting it. In the meanwhile, Vito Cassiofero, a small criminal boss who arrived in America at the same time as Joe and his family from Sicily, grew in power in the extortion racket. Joe was the only small businessman Vito did not extort because perhaps, in some way, Cassio Faro felt that it may well be Joe who will block his criminal career. Since Joe was the eldest son, he adapted to any job in order to not burden the family. At 13, he was a newsboy on the streets of Little Italy, then a shoeshine boy in front of the police headquarters on Mulberry Street. It is here that he met many agents who went to him to have their shoes clean. A biographer writes Raphael Sardo, being a police officer was always his dream. It was in his blood. He studied the English language, attended evening classes, and in 1878 obtained American citizenship and submitted an application for enrollment in the police. He was rejected. He tried again and again, but it was always the same story. At the end, he was able to get a job in the garbage sector, which was then a small department of the town police. Knowing Italian, he soon became helpful to the police, who used him as an informant to catch Italian criminals. Finally, on October 19, 1883, he enlisted in the New York police and wore a police uniform with number 285 on a silver badge on his chest. After a short training as a patrol officer on 13th Avenue, Petrozino began to climb the hierarchy levels, winning everybody's admiration for his methods inspired by a great passion for his job, instinct, intelligence, sense of responsibility, and high professionalism. His great dream and purpose of life was only one, to defeat the Mafia. In his police career, Petrozino accomplished legendary feats even earning the appreciation of Theodore Roosevelt, of whom he was a great friend. At 30, Petrozino was promoted to detective and entered the investigation section. He was promoted to lieutenant, the first Italian agent to enter the bureau. Since then, he wore only dark suits, Prince Albert-style overcoats, shoes with double soles, and a bowler hat. Petrozino then took command of the Italian branch, a group of five Italian agents, Maurice Benoil, Peter Dondero, George Silva, John Longos Marizni, Ugo Cassidy. In his opinion, Petrozino believed these five men were necessary to fight the Mafia in New York City. In New York, between Manhattan and Brooklyn, lived around one million Italian immigrants in the districts of Little Italy, East Harlem, and Williamsburg. One thing that Petrozino concentrated on during his tenure with the police department were the mechanisms through which the mafia infiltrated society. 
Well, they simply put, they infiltrated through the normal political structure. They they have a, a block of blocks of voters. They start off with organizing the voter in the communities, and then uh, they they have their businesses, and they start extorting. They through the extortion enterprise. Mm -hmm. You want our vote? You want this group of vote? You're going to have to pay us. And if we want something, we're going to come to you, and we want you to support our position. If not, when you come up for re-election, you will not get our vote. The same thing goes on today, but it's called different organizations. You've got all these lobbying harvesting. Well, ballot, ballot, ballot harvesting is, is a symptom of it, and, 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 but uh, it's the same thing goes on today. You just don't have, uh, a, you know, exclusive domain mm. of, of Italian Americans doing it. It's everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it, but that's how that's the that's the seed. Petrozino declared war on the powerful mafia bosses who were responsible for 46 percent of all murders committed in New York City. He took actions that no policeman had ever been able to take, with adventurous, legendary feats in his intelligent, determined style, without ever compromising on any level. His secret weapon was disguise, which allowed him to reach more closely into the complex world of the Mafia. The Italian branch was renamed the Italian Legion and was reinforced with 30 men. It was a team of agents with a license to kill free to act outside the law without the restrictions of the U.S. Constitution. Having the municipality turn down the project, the organization was funded by private citizens, 30,000 U.S. dollars for the first year of activity. As lieutenant of this organization, President Theodore Roosevelt cited Petrozino for his brilliant operations against gangsterism that resulted in 500 arrests and 2,500 expulsions, and awarded him the Medal of Valor. Some of his accomplishments as a police officer have been historically documented. Early in his career, when he was a beat policeman, Petrozino came to the rescue of a Mr. Washington who was being mugged by three thugs. When the dust settled, Mr. Washington and Joe Petrozino were still standing. The three thugs were beat to a pulp on the sidewalk and then later arrested. Convinced an innocent man, Angelo Carboni, was being sent to the electric chair Petrozino tracked the real killer down through two countries and over four weeks using disguises, impersonations, informants, and cunning police sense. He saved the innocent Italian immigrant from death and sent the real killer to the electric chair. Under his command, the Italian Legion shut down an insurance scam that preyed on naive immigrants in 1899. They were convinced to sign onto life insurance, but the seller made himself the beneficiary. The innocent immigrants always died soon after. Amazingly, he infiltrated an anarchist organization based in Italy that was responsible for the assassination of Italy's King Umberto. Petrozino discovered U.S. President McKinley was one of the group's targets and warned the Secret Service to have the president avoid Buffalo, New York. But McKinley refused to accept the warning despite his vice president, Teddy Roosevelt, vouching for his friend Petrozino's police skills. McKinley was assassinated soon after in Buffalo by an anarchist, making Teddy Roosevelt president of the United States. He famously worked two so-called barrel murder cases of note. A gangland counterfeiter who had talked too much was brutally murdered and stuffed in a barrel in 1902. This case was linked to the more famous case of another dead counterfeiter found in a barrel in 1903 that led Petrozino to Vito Cassiofero, the newly arrived Sicilian Mafia Don who was working to organize the various Italian gangs into one powerful crime group. Petrozino chased Ferro across the country to New Orleans, but Ferro escaped to Sicily. Cassiofero kept a photo of Petrozino in his wallet and told all and the sundry that one day he would kill his nemesis. After numerous threats on the policeman's life, Petrozino gave a public beating, in self-defense of course, to Ignacio Lupo, the Sicilian Mafia's top killer, who buried most of the bodies at his family's stables in Harlem. Petrozino beat Lupo to a pulp and stuffed him headfirst into an ash barrel on a street in Little Italy before the shocked and amused Italian immigrants, who only moments before would have crossed themselves in fear at the name of Lupo. Lupo never regained the standing he had before the beating and was soon after sent down on counterfeiting charges. The Italian Legion cut crime against Italian immigrants by half, 
and succeeded in dismantling the Calabrian crime organization in New York City, and they deported its Don, Enrico Alfani, back to Italy in 1907. Petrozino famously dragged Alfano all the way from the man's apartment down the street to the police station so all would see what eventually happens to criminals in New York City. His legion also broke up a giant prostitution ring run by the Sicilian Mafia in New York City in 1909. Newly arrived Sicilian women were coerced into prostituting themselves to save their lives or those of their relatives in New York or back in Sicily. Petrozino managed to put away all but one of the mobsters involved. On one evening when Petrozino celebrated his promotion to lieutenant with a few colleagues in the restaurant of Vincent Salino, they were attended to by a young lady named Adelina, the owner's daughter, a 37-year-old widow. That evening, after lots of Chianti, Petrozino made the proposal, you two must be very lonely. We might get on well, the two of us, together. She just nodded. On April 7, 1907, in the old church of St. Patrick in Mott Street, Monsignor Patrick J. Laval celebrated the wedding of Joe Petrozino and Adelina Salino. The Italian Legion was all there, as well as Police Chief Bingham. Lunch was offered in the restaurant of the bride's father. Afterwards, the couple reached their rented four-room apartment at 233 Lafayette Street. No honeymoon. Petrozino had too much work. In the summer of 1908, Joe Petrozino was in bed with bronchopneumonia. His wife, Adelina, was pregnant. Meanwhile, the Italian government informed him via the consulate that they wanted to offer him a gold watch with an inscription engraved in the case. In recognition for the intelligent work and the identification and arrest of the criminals escaped from Italian justice. Petrozino asked the New York consular permission to accept the gift. On November 30, 1908, Adelina Bianca Giuseppina Petrozino was born. Joe Petrozino ran home to devote himself to his baby girl after work. Towards the end of that year, the New York Police Department received a project by a skilled criminologist and expert on the methods of Italian crime, aimed at freeing New York of many foreigners who established a reign of lawlessness, blackmail, and murder. The project was considered effective to weaken the power of the black hand and its key was the collection of evidence in Italy against dangerous men. The appointment of secret agents for Italy was suggested and sending a detective to Italy for this purpose. On February 9, 1909, Petrozino left New York on the Duke of Genoa, traveling under the name of Simon Valletri in a first-class cabin. He had two suitcases of new yellow leather and a 38 Smith & Wesson. The detective, however, was not happy to leave his two-month-old baby. Petrozino was convinced that his mission was secret, but in America all the newspapers talked about it. The first to give the news was the New York Herald, where Commissioner Theodore Bingham confirmed Petrozino's departure for Italy, precisely to Sicily, where he will obtain important information about the Italian criminals residing in the United States. This probably started the order from New York to the Italian Mafia. From Genoa, Petrozino visited Milan, Bologna, and stayed in Rome a couple of days to meet Italian officials and the American ambassador. Then he visited Padua, his ancestral home, where his brother Vincenzo was living, promising he'd come to see him again on his return from Sicily. On February 28, 1909, Petrozino arrived in Palermo. A few hours later, he met the American consul but avoided any contact with the police. He said to the consul, I do not trust them at all. Here, I learned things that would make your hair stand on end. On March 12th, he told the American consulate of his intention to extend the investigation not to only the mafia, but also to the candidates in the upcoming elections and to the elements of politics and business. He found empty files in the folders of suspects deliberately deleted, if not entirely disappeared. He wrote down on his notebook in indelible pencil. Vito Cassio Ferro, born in Sambuca Zambut, a resident of Bisaquino, province of Palermo, a fearsome criminal. Then, walking in the rain and after spending the day in courthouse records in a nearby village, the detective returned to Palermo, dined at a small cafe, and then began to walk back to his hotel. Outside the Garibaldi Garden in Pizza Marina, he was accosted and shot four times, twice in the face. He went down returning fire. Don Vito Cassiofero 
had many witnesses who swore to his presence elsewhere at the time of the murder, but it has always been assumed that, of course, Don Vito was the man who personally pulled the trigger. Giuseppe Petrozino came home to New York a month later. In the streets of the Lower East Side, a quarter million sobbing Italians turned out to salute the passing coffin of the policeman who had freed so many of them from their black hand predators and made them all prouder Americans. It remains incalculable how dramatically different the history of New York City crime might have been had he lived to bring his list of names back to the department. I guess they wanted to know, I guess they identified Cassio Farrell as being the man who ordered the hit. I don't know who ordered the hit uh, from this side of the ocean, mm -hmm. but, uh, but they knew where he was in Rome. Then they knew his travel plans from Rome to Palermo. But wasn't it supposed to be a secret? <laughs> All the secrets, you know. And uh, uh, even with the lack of technology at the time, uh, you know, it's, you know, the whispering campaign probably went on that he was there. You know, he had a name, he acquired a name and things. So he probably had some infiltration in, in the Carabinieri, the police, national, Italian National Police, uh, that had uh, uh, probably known about him. I don't know why he didn't go to the square with bodyguards. That's the, that's the most perplexing thing. The investigation of Petrozino's murder was led by Police Commissioner Baldazar Ciola. He and his officers interviewed witnesses, but no one would admit to having seen anything or know anything. Fear of mafia reprisals dwarfed any desire to aid the investigation. Still, police rounded up about 140 suspects, including many Sicilians Petrozino had played a role in deporting from the United States. Although details were scant, Ciola soon came to believe the Petrozino killing was the work of the local mafia led by Vito Cassiofero. Cassiofero had crossed Petrozino back in New York years before, and he had a strong connection with Giuseppe Morello, who led the mafia in New York. Morello, too, had reason to see Petrozino dead. The day after Petrozino's shooting, the detective's Italian branch received an anonymous letter stating that the New York Black Hand had arranged the murder. The letter named members of the Morello family, Joe Morello, Vincenzo Terranova, Ciro Terranova, Giuseppe Fontana, Ignacio Melon, and Pietro Inzarillo. Cassio Ferro worked with these men during his three-year tenure in New York, so their involvement is possible, but we will probably never know for sure whether or not the letter was a hoax. The revelation coincided with the arrest of 95 suspected members of two clans involved in extortion rackets in the island's capital, Palermo. One of those arrested had been recorded boasting that his father's uncle had carried out the killing, police say. In 2014, during an unrelated investigation by Italian police, a descendant claimed that Paolo Palazzotto, a henchman of the Fontana crime ring of Palermo, was the actual killer, executing Cassio Ferro's hit. To honor the fallen detective, in 1987, the name of a triangular park in Lower Manhattan was changed from Kenmare Square to Lieutenant Joseph Petrozino Square in his honor. It is bounded by Cleveland Place and Lafayette and Kenmare Streets, two blocks north of the old police headquarters at 240 Center Street, at the juncture of Little Italy Melita and Soho neighborhoods. There was an exhibition dedicated to Petrozino in the Italian American Museum located at 155 Mulberry Street in Manhattan's Little Italy. The exhibit pays tribute to the lieutenant detective by displaying unique memorabilia documenting his career. It includes photographs, a vintage LP record, 
and an original black hand letter as well as both artwork and a comic book about his life. A plaster cast from the original 2014 bronze relief in Petrozino Square was donated to the museum by its creator, artist Carter Jones. On March 12, 2003, a small memorial and engraved brass plate on a pole was erected in Piazza Marina Palermo in Petrozino's remembrance. The Joe Petrozino Prize for Investigative Reporting in Italian, Sotosa di Padua Joe Petrozino Prize, was also named in his honor. In 2010, the Italian Post released a postage stamp to commemorate his 150th birthday. The stamp features Petrozino's picture with the Statue of Liberty and the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. As of March 2013, its 0.85 euro denomination is the correct one for postcards to the United States. Petrozino undoubtedly left a legacy of being the nation's top cop at the time as it pertained to pursuing the Mafia and their minions who perpetuated the undeserved stereotype given to all Italians and Sicilians in the United States. His death certainly served as a warning to others who sought to expose and bring to justice those who criminalize daily living, especially in large cities. The Mafia still carried on their business interests, and had Petrozino lived, he may have been one of the most successful police commissioners in New York City and American history. Well, the history, the way the, uh, the news media has created this uh, aura around Italian Americans, particularly Sicilian Americans being in the so-called mafia, Hollywood with their movies and shows. I mean, everybody says the best movie ever made was The Godfather. It's not a bad movie, very good movie. It captures somewhat of, uh, some of the essence of what organized crime was. Goodfellas does the same thing, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's the imagination that these people have, you know, have uh, captured through the press and through the entertainment industry. Did, did, did the La Cosa Nostra and the Mafia exist? Yeah. Now don't forget, we're on Rumble, Facebook, Twitter, buy me a cup of coffee, and we'll be around here for quite a while. Until next time.